You're listening to The World at Eat with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Monday the 11th of March. Tory councillor guilty of breaching of conduct. 650 workers received text message on redundancies. Judges anger as money is wasted on interpreters who can't even speak English. Family honour hides incest in Holland's Muslim community. Two French jihadists detained in Mali. Parisian war zones, bulletproof vest required. Sweden, octogenarian narrowly escapes wax and polish. Athens Mosque will cost Greece $1.1 million. Egyptian superhero breaks taboo on sexual violence. Two injured in an attack on Coptic church. Al-Azhar scholar Christian Copts will pay jizya. Thought for the day, is it fair? And finally, kaboom or not kaboom? UK News. Sherban Dorset, Tory councillor guilty of breaching of conduct. Sherban councillor Tory Marjorie Snowden was found guilty of breaching code of conduct at Standards Committee hearing she refused to attend by investigating officer Roger Green of the West Dorset District Council. Mrs Snowden, 85, was accused of saying all Muslims are terrorists and why should we be interested in black history? During an inequality training session led by equality officer Sue Bickle, on June 28, 2012. Ms Bickle's complaint was supported by Liberal Democrat District Councillor Molly Rennie. Councillor Snowden, ordered by West Dorset District Councillors to apologise in writing to Ms Bickle, was defiant in her response. I'm not politically correct and I'm not apologising to anyone. I did not say all Muslims are terrorists, although it is a well-known saying. It's something that has been said many times. It's also not strictly true that I asked why we should be interested in black history. What I actually said is that we waste far too much money on multicultural black history. Why are we wasting taxpayers' money on it? In her official response to the allegations, Miss Snowden said, Miss Bickle, unfortunately, is incompetent as a trainer and was not suited to dealing with the session I attended. I'm afraid the truth does hurt on occasion. The session is a waste of council taxpayers' money. My comments at all times were personal from me and because I believed them to be true. The South West News Service reports, Mrs Snowden, a former Surrey councillor and twice Mayor of Sherbon, claimed she was the victim of political opponents with local council elections on the horizon. World Date says, Although she will not appreciate the comment, this woman is marvellous. She should join us and leave the Tory party. It's also worth noting that Mrs Snowden had been the outspoken opponent of Tesco's plans to turn Sherbourne's principal hotel into a superstore. The No Thanks Tesco petition has attracted 10,000 signatures, whilst the Bring Tesco to Sherbourne has garnered a paltry 180 signatures by March the 9th, 2013. Why is it that the accusation and censure only surfaced in the face of Mrs Snowden's opposition to Tesco plans, which were announced in December 2012, whilst the complaint was made concerning comments allegedly made in June 2012. Could it be politics and political correctness gone mad in Sherbourne, Dorset? 650 workers at Britain's deepest coal mine, which was devastated by fire, have been sacked by text message. Headlines, you have to love them, from the Daily Mail. The message from the manager of Dormill Colliery near Philongley, Warwickshire, read, I apologise for the late note but the company will formally announce the closure of Dormill Mill without chance of reprieve tomorrow. Miner Dave News, 55, a worker for 38 years, brands closure, heartbreaking. He adds, I saw grown men who've worked there all their lives openly crying. The site is being closed after the worst mine fire in 30 years, destroyed all usable coal, and UK coal claims texts were sent because they didn't want employees to learn about the closure on the news. World Date says, The mine has been under threat for the last 12 months, and the fire which began last month was the final straw. Our thoughts are with the workers and the owners, both being subjected to headlines of Door Mill, hundreds of jobs go as fire hit mine, and 650 jobs up in smoke, pit fire set to force one of Britain's last coal mines to shut, 
whilst the Daily Mail screams, sacked by text. Judges' anger as money is wasted on interpreters who can't even speak English. It's wrecking the system and screw-ups are now endemic, says QC. The Daily Mail is reporting Michael Turner QC and Judge Richard Bray are fed up with the use of interpreters from Polish call centre Capita Translating and Interpreting. Michael Turner QC claims screw-ups over interpreters in the UK courts is now endemic as top translators will not work for Capita because of its low pay. Judge Richard Bray accused the firm of being hopelessly incompetent after trial against a Vietnamese drug king was halted because no interpreter arrived at Northampton Crown Court. Some of the language experts supplied by Capita Translating and Interpreting from a base in Krakow cannot even speak fluent English, claim the lawyers. A World Date reporter states, It is well known that this poor state of pay does not extend to us in the UK, where we pay very high fees through the nose for very little return. European News. Family honour hides incest in Holland's Muslim community. Radio Netherlands Worldwide reports four Dutch Moroccan women, Rabia, Zora, Iptisam and Saida, were all sexually abused by members of their families, their fathers, uncles, brothers or cousins. After years of silence, they have decided to speak out because they know that many other Muslim women suffer the same fate. A care worker states, Taboos, secrecy, silence, shame and a closed community are almost a recipe for sexual abuse. The idea of family honour meant that these women kept their mouths shut. Now they're telling their stories to try and break the taboo surrounding sexual abuse in Muslim families. They no longer see themselves as victims. Their mission is to help other women who are in trouble now. Young Muslim women who are abused do not figure in criminal reports. Neither do their abusers. If it isn't reported, it isn't recorded. It isn't in the statistics, and there isn't any help. Zora Acharat, psychiatrist with the Fire Frisland Emergency Shelter in Freiland, in the north of the Netherlands, says, Muslim men are underrepresented in vice cases. That's why we tend to overlook things. In most cases, Muslim girls don't file a complaint. That's why the abuse goes unnoticed. It's not just in the Netherlands that incest goes unreported. Support workers in Morocco and Denmark Know that the abuse goes on there too, but again, there are no available figures. And no figures means no help. As Vern Timmer from the National Centre for Expertise on Honour-Related Violence says, We don't draw conclusions from the stories of individual women, but from research based on hundreds of dossiers. That leads me to conclude that there isn't a higher instance of incest in the Muslim community than in the native Dutch community. A World Date writer comments, no, but it does mean that when the Muslims don't go after the local population of underage girls as sexual objects, they resort to their own relations. Charming. Two French jihadists detained in Mali Two French nationals who had joined Islamist fighters in Mali have been detained in the past week, France's Defence Minister said Friday. This story was first reported by All Africa, a Radio France international website, before being picked up by France 24. About a dozen French citizens are thought to be fighting with Islamists against French troops in the country. France's defence minister says two French citizens fighting alongside extremists have been detained over the past week in the West African country of Mali. French authorities have warned that disaffected French radicals could travel to Mali to join Al-Qaeda-linked forces and potentially come home with skills to stage terrorist attacks in Europe. Jean-Yves Le Drian said on Europe One Radio Friday that two Frenchmen had been detained in Mali since French forces launched a military campaign there in January. One was detained by Malian police and extradited to France on Thursday, de Le Drian said. He said the other was taken prisoner during fighting in northern Mali and will be extradited on Friday. World Today comments, Well, finally, we see the French aren't immune to homegrown jihadists. When will the West wake up to the terrorists in our midst and dish out the right punishment? Death. Parisian war zones, bulletproof vest required. According to Bare Naked Islam and the Gates of Vienna, reports on a Hungarian TV team's visit to the Banaluz or suburb of Paris, there are war zones where you need a bulletproof vest. Thanks to Muslim immigration, French tourists should not enter certain areas of Paris without wearing a vest. There are suburbs of Paris where police are forced to use military-style armoured vehicles to enter the multicultural sensitive zones, aka Islamic no-go zones. The largest of these Parisian districts is urging the deployment of the army due to the continuously increasing number of armed conflicts. 
There are districts in which the police do not dare enter without being armed to the back teeth. On the gates of Vienna is a link to the Hungarian TV team video where they get spat on, jostled and there was also an attempt to run them over. By the way, in France, 40,000 cars are set on fire every year by young Muslim thugs. These are used as traps for the police. That is how they decoy the police in order to attack them. If needed, we enter even the most dangerous zones, yet not with everyday police cars, but with full weaponry, the police chief of District V said. We must plan carefully how to withdraw before we enter these zones. Neither do I deny that the police pay a huge price for this. Many of my colleagues were wounded during these operations, but this doesn't scare us, says Muriel Sobri, police commander of the 5th arrondissement, who is described as an iron fist in a velvet glove by Paris Match. Sweden, octogenarian, narrowly escapes wax and polish. An 84-year-old man got a proper scrub after getting stuck in an automatic car wash at his son's petrol station in Vaxo, South Sweden but he managed to escape before the wax and polish program kicked in. My son's first comment when I got out was, well, now you're clean at least, the man told local paper, Smallen Post and SNP. The 82-year-old Tag Schill was seemingly in good spirits after the ordeal. He had accidentally started the automatic car wash when passing a sensor, which put the system in motion. It was frightening and terribly noisy. I couldn't hear or see anything and I was trying to get out of there, said Schill who had gone into the car wash area to clean up. I didn't notice the woman who put her card in to drive into the automatic car wash, said Shill. I only realised when the car wash suddenly kicked in and water splashed from all directions, and there I was in the middle of it all. I got washed instead of the car. Luckily, Shill managed to escape unharmed, although he did get completely drenched. The woman rushed out of her car and apologised, but it wasn't her fault, not in the least, said Shill. The gentleman octogenarian ran into the petrol station shop to get the woman a new complimentary car wash pass before driving home to put some dry clothes on. Thanks to the English translation from the local Sweden's news in English. Athens Mosque will cost Greece $1.1 million. The Greek reporter in Greece tells us it'll cost the cash-strapped Greek government, which is cutting pay, raising taxes and slashed pensions for workers, pensioners and the poor some 846,000 euros, about $1.1 million, to build an official mosque in Athens for the city's Muslim population. The design, however, is slated to have a modern look and not that of the Ottoman mosques with minarets, the newspaper Tania reported, adding that all that's needed for the project to begin for the Transportation Ministry is the bidding procedures for construction. The government agreed in September of 2012 to go ahead with the plans after an offer from the Turkish government to pay for it was rejected by Prime Minister Antonis Samaris and opposed by the Muslim community, which wanted the Greek state to undertake it. Metropolitan Seraphim of Piraeus said he was vehemently opposed to having Greece build a mosque who said it should be declared unconstitutional and anti-Greek. The idea of a mosque is still touchy in Greece, which suffered under 400 years of Ottoman occupation, when churches were forbidden and as the Turkish government has refused to reopen the closed Halki Seminary. World Date says, I hope Golden Dawn takes the appropriate corrective actions, and I have no doubt they will. The Greek elites must be crazy if they think the Greeks are going to stand for this insanity whilst they have no food, money or health care. I'm foaming at the mouth over the sheer madness of this one. World News Egyptian superhero breaks taboo on sexual violence. Egyptian women have a new ally in their fight against sexual harassment, a superhero taking on the country's sexual predators. France 24 talked to the creator of Supermutt, a comic character inspired by Superman. Supermutt, or Superman with an Egyptian twist. Dressed in white underwear and a floral motive cape, the comic superhero is fighting against Egypt's rampant sexual harassment of women. After a brief appearance in the opposition newspaper El Justeur in 2007, the Cairo superhero reappeared on the cover of Tok Tok, the first Egyptian magazine, launched in the tumultuous pre-revolutionary days of January 2011. In that story, Supermark helps a young woman who tries to avoid the pressing demands of a strange Santa Claus. Worth Date said, naturally, it would have to be an evil European and a pagan Judeo one at that. Al-Azhar scholar, Christian Cox will pay Jizya. 
According to Middle Eastern Islamic specialist Raymond Ibrahim, Egyptian Copts Christians will pay the jizya. He reports, during a recent interview, Dr. Mahmoud Shaban, a professor at Egypt's prestigious Al-Azhar University, made clear that the Copts, Egypt's Christian minority, will pay the jizya, what is often referred to in the West as an Islamic poll tax. According to Al-Azhar professor, if non-Muslims were to learn the meaning of jizya, they would ask for it to be applied, and we will apply it, just like Islam commands us to. His logic is that if Christians pay the jizya, they would buy for themselves protection. Hence, why they themselves should want to pay it. Most Western apologists for Islam also claim that jizya money was historically paid to protect conquered dhimmis, though they often imply protection from outside enemies, non-Muslims. In fact, the jizya was, and is, protection money from the surrounding Muslims themselves, precisely Shuban's point. Pay up and maybe your churches won't be burnt and your girls routinely abducted. Because you are not paying, you are not protected from such things and have no right to complain. World Date reports in brief, Wikipedia defines jizya as a per capita tax on a section of Islamic State's non-Muslim citizens in return for permission to practice their faith. Two injured in an attack on Coptic Church. Last Thursday, a Coptic Christian church located in Benghazi, Libya, was attacked by armed Muslim militants. Initial reports indicate that at least one priest, Father Paul Isaac, was injured as well as his assistant. It's the second church in Libya to be attacked in two months. In December 2012, France 24 reported an explosion rocked a Christian Coptic church near the western Libyan city of Misrata, killing two people and wounding two others, all of them Egyptians, according to an Egyptian diplomat. The unnamed diplomat said, The church explosion was in the town of Daphnia in Misrata province. The consul went directly to Misrata to find out the details. We still don't have clear information. World Date comments, Well, I guess they forgot to pay their jizya. That's what we get with Islamic democracies such as Libya. Attacks on Christians rarely, if ever, occurred under Colonel Gaddafi. Thought for the day, is it fair? Now, I know that people don't like being told what to do. In fact, we British have made great inroads into that state of mind since the last war. And also that we don't like being told the truth. That fact reveals itself in some of the off-topic comments on the BMP site. And sometimes I wonder if anyone listens to my thoughts on the odd occasion. Because I usually tell people what to do and the truth. My topic today is the heading, Is it fair? Now, fairness is not objective any more, if it ever has been. The old adage, bad things happen to good people, seems to be reigning supreme in this society of ours today. The one thing guaranteed to make me hopping mad is unfairness, and the way it seems to affect the good, normal, everyday people in my country. I will just read out a few points and leave it to you to make your mind up over whether they are unfair or we're just too lazy to care. My eldest son, who is blindingly liberal and has contacts through work with educated Romanians and has a very good Polish help, cannot see the huge problem waiting in the wings. But is it fair? Probably not, because it will not be the educated Romanians we get, but the Romas. Is it fair that we in the UK are ignoring the plight of the German city of Duisburg, in which certain areas have been reduced to less than third world levels of sanitation and safety by the already unchecked immigration of Roma gypsies. The mayor of Duisburg, Soren Link, has already said his piece, and after the initial wave of disbelief and poo-pooing, literally in this case, as these people stand and defecate outside their new hovels, and bear in mind this guy's a lefty, and we all know how much they stand up for minorities, so these people must be pretty foul. I've read all the bump on them, and yup, they are a foul and ugly people, I am afraid. Now, is it fair that our government will ignore the fact that these are, in no way, nice, gentle, educated Romanians who just want a better life? These Romas give a bad name to the title Gypsy, and in fact give a bad name to human life in general. Pictures show children giving V signs, awful pregnant girls, and filthy, unkempt youths, all of whom, of course, sport mobile phones. And they are coming to a place near you. All 29 million inhabitants of Romania and Bulgaria from January 2014 will claim rights to live, work and claim benefits here 
in the EU ruling of freedom of movement. So if you think that is fair, think on. Now, facts you may not know. There are 10 million of them wandering the earth. As to their religion, very little can be gauged as they are mostly illiterate. But a high percentage adhere to the form of Hinduism mixed with Catholicism. However, in Bulgaria, over 100,000 are Muslim. And in Romania, 70,000 are Muslim. And they tend to take the religion which is predominant in their host countries. And as these figures are 12 years old, I wonder how many more followers of Islam will be coming to our country under the guise of being a gypsy. Just a thought. But is it fair we are allowing more migrants in when we are already paying through the nose, both socially and financially, for the ones already here? Is it fair? Is it fair that the Queen is standing up for equal rights for all, and I mean all, when she hasn't stood up for the armed forces in her own country and is so busy treading the politically correct path around all the minefields of accommodating what are, in a sense, whole new countries and cultures into this island of ours, that she has forgotten that she is Queen of England, not Europe, not the world, and certainly not the third world, which used to be ours and is no longer. There is no British Commonwealth now, just a business organisation called the Commonwealth, which keeps some links because we still support them financially. Gay rights, ethnic rights, and that old cherry, gender equality. No one is equal. No gender is equal because it would have to be equal to what? Her Madge should see how her serving soldiers are treated when flying on our airlines. Is it fair that a female soldier was told she couldn't fly because her combat suit was offensive to other passengers? Petty Officer House had worn her uniform on the flight from the US to the UK the week before with no trouble. But Islam-ridden UK invokes almost Sharia law on the way out of our country. Why? Because in truth, most of the staff at Heathrow, probably including the G4S security staff involved, are ethnics who might well be Muslims. And we all know how offended those prats are faced with a uniform they can't bomb or shoot at. The G4S guy told her to put on the sleeping pyjamas, which bear an unhealthy resemblance to a suicide bomber's outfit. Or Miss House would not be allowed to fly on her return flight to the US. The reason given is not fair and should not be so in this country. From Virgin came the reason for the ghastly black jammies and the debacle in front of a large queue. We don't always fly British passengers, and you would be seen as a threat. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought all these Muslims called themselves British once they set foot on home soil, so that doesn't apply, and anyone foreign who objected should be put on another flight full of fellow objectors and flown somewhere very safe like Guantanamo. Now, what is fair is that poor Petty Officer House should be given free flights for the future and in business class for all her trauma. Is it fair that more than one in 20 soldiers, airmen and naval personnel have suffered abuse and attempted violence at the hands of what is termed thugs because they served in the military and wear their uniforms in public? This would not have happened in the United States where they respect their service personnel. It could only happen in guilt-ridden Britain, and only the Brits would allow it to happen. Now, is that fair? Is it fair that all our people living with benefits and in, I believe, council properties or council-funded properties are losing a large percent of their benefits, either under the guise of spare rooms or some such excuse, whilst we are still sending £12 billion overseas under the guise of foreign aid? Is it fair that the heading on the mail was, at last Tories see sense on aid? Oh really? Where? And how? And when? This sense doesn't apply to our own poor on benefits and the disabled and elderly who need money more than ever, but seems to apply to a government who is not stopping foreign aid, but just dispersing it through so-called British companies, if any exist nowadays, which will involve more money and more backhanders, and still go to the wrong people who will still squander it or simply lose it in personal accounts in Switzerland. So no revelations there, I'm afraid, and no fairness to our own. Is it fair that we're cutting back so much from our armed forces that the parachute regiment for the first time ever will have virtually no training in parachute jumping before battles? In normal times, any soldier would have to complete eight live jumps before being considered safe to jump in times of war. 
Is it fair that racist bullying has come to infant schools and victims as young as five are being accused of being racist by their teachers, who seem to be paid to promote not only diversity, but perversity and ignorance when it comes to their ethnic charges? No, none of what I have said is fair. It is all grossly unfair. But the question I would ask is what are we prepared to do about it? We, the Brits, have only ourselves to blame for these tips of icebergs, because if we don't do something about it, or at least voice an opinion, then we're as bad as the people who encourage these disastrous changes to our culture, as we are in effect condoning what is and will happen to our country. And that is the unfairest thing of all. And finally, kaboom or not kaboom, or army bomb squad called to defuse laminate shelving. It was reported in the Telegraph that a Surrey town centre was cordoned off for four hours after a bomb squad was called to a chemist's to dispose of a suspicious package, which turned out to be laminate shelves. In true Brit hysterical style, local police enforced a 100-metre cordon in stains upon Thames in Surrey after bosses at the Sunset Pharmacy called 999 when an unexpected delivery turned up in a wooden crate. The bomb squad turned up after being alerted and travelled the 23 miles from Aldershot to examine the package. And yes, a controlled explosion was carried out on the box at 2.30, when officers found that the box contained laminate shelves, and the town centre was reopened by 3.30. Inspector Jackie Drew of Surrey Police said, We were called to Sunset Pharmacy after they had received a parcel that hadn't been anticipated. It was a sealed wooden box secured shut. They weren't able to account for its origin, we dealt with it as suspicious and sought advice from an army explosive team that came down from Aldershot. As a result of them being unsure, they carried out a controlled explosion that blew the box open. It was found to be some product used in DIY laminate shelving covers. There was nothing of any concern. Many locals were bewildered by the actions of police following the incident, which happened last Wednesday. Ian Fledger, 51, said, If everyone called the police when they got delivery of something they weren't expecting, the police would never do anything other than open up boxes. This presenter says, It seems odd that a pharmacy wouldn't recognise shelving if they ordered it. Or if not, what are shelves doing being delivered to a chemist? All in all, much ado about nothing, or kaboom, or not kaboom. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I wish you all a very good night.